Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the third part of our um, webinar series, our Pediatric Digestive Health webinar series. Today we are going to be talking about um, abdominal pain in kiddos. So going into a little bit more detail of different types of abdominal pain, different things that it could be causing. Um, and of course, as usual, any questions are welcome. So let's get started. Oops. Okay, so today the objectives are what types of abdominal pain are normally seen in children? What could be causing my child's, child's abdominal pain? What can I do about this pain? And how can I heal my child's gut so that they don't have problems in the future? So let's get started. So again, just a review. Um, personally, my digestive issues have led me on the path to um, where I am today as a naturopathic doctor and my passion for gut health. Um, I have found throughout my life and also, of course, schooling and my um, clinical knowledge that gut health is at the core of all chronic illness and wellness. Um, so it's really important um, to make sure that you address your child's health and, and your own for that matter, um, so that we can rebalance that system. So remember, I've said this a few times before, 70% of your immune system is in your gut. And a new fact here today is that we have a second nervous system in our gut. So we have our central nervous system in the brain and an enteric nervous system in the gut. So there are 500 million neurons that are in the gut. That's compared to um, about 100 billion neurons in the adult human brain. So there's a lot of neurons in the gut, which is why there are oftentimes so many issues that stem from the gut and go to other places in the body. So abdominal pain in children is very, very common. About one in three children um, is seen by a doctor for abdominal pain by the age of 15. And only a small number of these children have a real, real problem that needs to be fixed outside of just dietary changes or physical changes, things like that. Um, oftentimes the abdominal pain in kiddos is found from um, eating dietary changes, foods, um, new food introductions, um, and also bowel changes or, or habits that need to be kind of addressed. Um, abdominal pain can also come from infections, um, diet, constipation, diarrhea, that, that's bowel changes habits. Um, medications and simply abnormal development of the digestive system. So this pain um, can, in kids is a little bit different than adults. You know, adults can just say, my stomach hurts. Kids can um, manifest their pain by crying, having gas, constipation or diarrhea, vomiting. Um, oftentimes kids pull their legs into their chest. So they kind of hold their tummy. Um, with their legs, poor eating, or colicky babies. Um, and abdominal pain is often very frightening and frustrating for parents, like I said, because kids can't really say, mom, my tummy hurts, or dad, my tummy hurts, right? So um, it can be difficult to find the cause of abdominal pain. Um, so that's why it can be very challenging. Um, Something to note is that pain without other symptoms that goes away in three hours or less is usually not serious. So I'll repeat that. Pain without other symptoms that usually goes away in about three hours or less is usually not serious. So it's just something to note. Um, you know, if you hit the three hour mark and it's had, has gone away already, maybe not something to worry about. Um, if it lasts longer than three hours, something maybe to address more seriously. And again, always ask why, always ask what, um, you know, what's going on in, in the child's body so that you can get the resolution of the symptom, not just covering that up. Um, and I've said this the last two weeks, but the body doesn't do anything randomly. So remember that um, the abdominal pain is there for a reason. Um, again, finding the cause can be challenging, but it's important to do so. 
So nice picture here of the digestive system. This isn't an adult, so not. Um, it'll look a little bit different in, in a child, um, especially because things kind of move change um, within, you know, as, as kids develop. But to notice kind of where things are located, so the liver, the pancreas, the gallbladder, um, kind of the stomach is on it's, it's kind of on the upper left side, sort of the liver is upper right side. Um, the gallbladder is right below the liver. Um, it secretes the bile that helps to digest fats. Um, and then we have the large intestine um, going kind of sort of encircling the small intestine um, and the appendix down there at the bottom there. Okay. And so um, I like this image because if you take note or look at it a little bit longer, um, it addresses the gut brain access and psychological factors. So I, I mentioned um, that, you know, a lot of things start in the gut and then kind of move to other systems. And this sort of explains why the brain and the gut are so highly related. And remember, um, the, there's a second nervous system in the digestive system in the gut. So noting that the, the two nervous systems are highly related. Okay. So this just goes into a little bit more detail um, about certain neurotransmitters, certain psychological factors, things like that. So take a screenshot of this if you want to um, look at it a little bit more in depth. Okay, so these are the three types of abdominal pain. There's a visceral pain that's more dull, diffuse. Um, the, it involves organs. Um, so visceral just mean, is, is meaning organs, basically. So um, many organs have common innervation with, um, with a low, smaller concentration of nerve endings. And so the pain fibers that are located in the wall of these organs um, can cause pain sometimes. And that one can be a little bit more difficult to diagnose there. Parietal pain, um, that's more intense, more localized. So the, um, this one has a greater concentration of nerve endings, which is why it's more intense. Um, and it can be it can be stimulated by things as simple as inflammation. So if you think of uh, the appendix, that would be like, or appendicitis, that would be a parietal pain, very intense, right at the spot of the appendix. Chronic pain, now this one can be challenging as well. Um, oftentimes caused by stress or anxiety in kids. Um, the, the pain is usually, you know, kids have a hard time describing it. It's not really in one spot, it's sort of all over. Um, generally. So one in six kids will have chronic, have, have a chronic abdominal pain complaint. Um, generally, once physical causes are ruled out, history usually supports a psychological cause. So, so keep that in mind with chronic pain and um, psychological factors. The most common causes relate to school or family life stressors, um, anxieties there. It's important um, to know that we still need to treat this as real pain, although it may be due to psychological factors, it's still um, important to address any stressors that are in the child's life um, that may require counseling, that may require, um, you know, addressing school things, um, friends, schoolwork, how they deal with that. So. Um, all things to, to, to um. okay, so acute abdomen. Um, this is sudden and severe abdominal pain that may um, usually suggest surgery. So um, abdominal pain and tenderness that are in one spot, um, they can move, the, the, the pain can move, the pain can get worse. And rebound tenderness just means that if you press into the pain, um, that it, it, it's painful coming out and sometimes can um, radiate to other places within the abdomen. Um, sometimes has a moderate uh, temperature elevation because sometimes it can be um, very sudden infection or inflammation um, and oftentimes is accompanied by nausea and vomiting. Um, so think 
necessary to get to the hospital pretty quickly if it's really sudden and severe. Um, oftentimes if, if the pain um, comes before vomiting, oh, I'm sorry, acute abdomen, meaning pain precedes the vomiting. So pain is there before vomiting, um, gastroenteritis, meaning food, um, sorry, I can't think here this morning. Um, in, like getting an infection from food um, that can, the pain can come with or after vomiting. So something to note there to differentiate the difference. Appendicitis, so I mentioned this, this is more of like a, um, a parietal pain. This can happen at any age. It's most commonly um, right in the beginning of puberty as the body is growing, developing. Um, it's not common before the age of two. It is. It can come on steadily over 12 hours, so it can be pain, fever, um, you know, not wanting to eat, kind of feeling nauseous and it can progressively get worse over 12 hours. Um, and in infants, if it does happen before the age of two or around age two, um, sometimes all you'll notice is that they're, they uh, kind of bring their legs up to their belly. Um, they flex there and they might not even cry because it hurts so badly. Um, so you know, a, a marked change in their um, kind of behavior might lead to appendicitis or thinking that it might be that, especially if it's new, an, a newer onset. Okay, Meckel's diverticulum. So this one is interesting. Um, it's, it's upon growth development, the the intestine, the small intestine grows a small pouch um, that causes pain because it shouldn't be there, right? So there's not a lot of room in the abdomen there. And so it causes, it causes pain. Um, you can see down at the bottom that picture there. Um, it can happen at any age, but it's most common um, before age two. And again, that's because of the growth and the development um, can cause uh, bleeding from the anus, um, sometimes can be painless. Um, it rarely becomes in, rarely becomes inflamed and it can often, um, act like appendicitis. So sometimes those signs and symptoms can be the same in kids. Um, okay. So that one is definitely something to, I would be aware that that's uh, you know, that that's a risk factor in kids less than two. Um, nothing you can really do to, to avoid it, uh, but just be aware that it's there. Um, not, not, you know, extremely common, but it is common um, enough. So Meckel's diverticulum, and it usually goes away on its own. Um, so it doesn't really need surgery or anything. It just kind of goes away, but it can be painful. Okay, intussusception. Um, I think I have I have a picture on the next slide of what it looks like, so I'll explain it now first. Um, so this is a commonly abdominal pain in children, um, six months to two years old is the most common age of intussusception, just because again it's because or it occurs with uh, growth and development of the digestive system. So basically. Um, a segment of the bowel will kind of go into the other, an adjacent segment. So it kind of like wraps up into itself. Again, I'll show you a picture. Um, sign symptoms, extremely colicky children. Um, can You can sometimes feel in the right upper quadrant, um, so like a mass, a little hardness there. Um, the most common finding that um, parents can actually see is uh, their stools at, you know, it's a late finding. So it's already occurred. Um, but kiddos can have a current jelly stool. So kind of, you know, purplish, reddish, jelly-like stool. 
Um, again, drawing up the legs to the belly and extreme fatigue, lethargy is our common symptoms. Some common labs to identify um, intestception is x-ray or CT scan. So this is the picture. I keep having to move my little face. Um, so on, oops. On the left side here, that's a normal large intestine, small intestine. Um, it can happen at, really in any part of the intestine. Generally, it happens um, right where um, the, the small intestine goes into the large intestine. Um, so on the right side, that's kind of what intestception looks like. So it's basically that the uh, one part of the intestine goes, wraps back up into the other intestine there. Okay, things that mimic acute abdominal pain. Um, gastroenteritis, again, we kind of mentioned that before, the stomach flu can be caused by viral or bacterial infection. Um, so you often see, you know, fever, chills, um, sometimes vomiting, nausea in kids, and stomach pain. Um, mesenteric adenitis. So this may be um, preceded by flu-like symptoms, um, may have kind of diffuse uh, abdominal pain in the right lower quadrant of the, um, of the abdomen, often has high, um, high temperature, so fever, um, greater than 101 is generally mesenteric adenitis. Less than 101 um, is usually appendicitis. So that's kind of a differentiation there. Um, but basically mesenteric adenitis is inflammation of the lymph nodes um, in the abdominal wall. Okay, so um, again, it's, it's inflammation um, causing higher fever, high temperature above 101 degrees Fahrenheit um, and sometimes can mimic uh, the stomach flu early on as well. The other one is a urinary tract infection that can cause um, abdominal pain in kiddos. Sometimes urinary tract infections are simply caused by children holding their urine, um, not having enough water to create enough urine to go, um, and maybe not noticing that they need to go. Those are some common causes there. Okay, non-GI causes of abdominal pain. So these are things that cause abdominal pain but don't have maybe anything to do with the gastrointestinal system. Um, these, these are pneumonia, leukemia, um, pelvic inflammatory disease, acute rheumatic fever, and diabetic ketoacidosis. So if you have more questions on those specifically, um, ask any questions on Facebook and in, in the Zoom chat, or um, of course you can call the office as well. I'm just not gonna go too much into them because it's, excuse me, it's non-GI causes. So, but wanted to leave those there so you guys also understand that there are some causes of, causes of abdominal pain that are sort of outside of the digestive system realm. Okay, so um, getting to common treatments of abdominal pain. So of course, first and foremost, we want to rule out, um, rule in or out different diseases or causes of the abdominal pain. So common treatments in the conventional medical world, um, antibiotics, um, they will do imaging to kind of assess um, over-the-counter drugs or medications. Um, and then surgery is often a common, um, common treatment when it's severe, of course. Um, and surgery definitely have its has its time and place um, for sure. Naturopathic treatment, we always start again with dietary and lifestyle changes, alterations, assessment there. Um, if, if your child has just started eating a new food and maybe they're either intolerant to it or it's just new for the di digestive system, you know, looking into all of that, um, making sure they have proper hydration. Um, dehydration is a big thing in kiddos. And so we wanna make sure they're drinking enough water, getting enough electrolytes in. Um, bowel changes, so that, that simply, you know, starting to um, 
with food introductions, stools can become bulkier, um, sometimes harder to pass, depending on the diet. Um, you know, if they're not digesting their food properly, if they just started with school and, um, you know, they don't want to go at school, sometimes it cause, gets backed up and then it can hurt. Um, so some of the things here we can look at is supporting regular bowel movements, um, asking children if they need to go. Um, so that kind of reminds them, oh, I, I could go now. It's okay to go. Or, you know, sometimes they just forget kids are, they get excited about playing and TV and things like that. They forget. Um, so the other things can be squatty potties to help them. Um, if, if they just need a little bit more relaxation in the belly there. Um, and then let me see. Okay. I'm kind of going into both slides, but, um, other things too. So we have a lot of tools in the office, um, to help diagnose and treat, um, abdominal pain. So coming into the office is sometimes more beneficial than trying to figure it all out, um, on your own. So we're here to help. Um, okay, so going a little bit more into depth here. So of course, assessing for the underlying cause, um, comprehensive intake and history of the abdominal pain of the, of the child. Um, we can order imaging as needed to see if there's, for some reason, constipation, you know, if there's, like I said, intussusception or mechos diverticulum, you know, if there's an actual physical malformation there. Um, food intolerance and other testing can also be beneficial uh, for that to make sure that, you know, it's not just simply something they're eating that's causing that. Um, so let's see other things to, to note for assessing for underlying cause. Um, if it is constipation or diarrhea, going back to the first webinar that I made on pediatric digestive health um, can be helpful there. So again, just making sure we have the real cause so we can treat it accordingly. Um, changes to be made. So we want to remove offending foods or adding in foods or fluids that are beneficial um, for the child's digestive health. Um, making sure that they're drinking enough water, enough liquids, um, replacing electrolytes. Um, for infants older than nine months, we want about a third of their body weight in ounces of water per day. Again, so let's just say easy 90, they weigh 90 pounds. They want to um, be drinking at least 30 ounces of liquids daily. Um, for children younger than nine months, generally uh, breast milk is enough fluids there. Um, reminding children of regular toilet time first thing in the morning and after every meal is a beneficial one. Remember, we want kids to be going to the bathroom, having a stool bowel movement um, after every meal. That's like the most ideal. Um, and it's also the most ideal for, for adults which doesn't tend to be very common, but the baseline minimal is one bowel movement a day. So we want three at least per day um, of bowel movements for both kids and adults. Um, and then of course, specific supplements may be necessary. You know, if they have an infection in the gut, we have micro, um, antimicrobial botanicals to help with that. Um, if they need more, you know, diversity with their bacteria, probiotics, um, helping the, the bowels move if that's an issue there. So lots going on um, with different supplements that we can um, use after assessment and diagnosis. And so what can you do? So of course, um, supporting digestive health from the start, um, you know, making sure kids are eating properly, getting enough um, variation in foods, hydration, um, and, you know, listening and paying attention to your child. Again, going back to that chronic pain um, being oftentimes psychological in nature, um, it's important to listen and, and pay attention to the signs and symptoms your child is giving you um, because just simply that and, and some love and support can alleviate a lot of these um, painful kind of bouts. Um, maintaining a basic diet, assessing for food intolerances, um, high fiber to support regular bowel movements um, and supporting your child's ability to create healthy poops. Um, then. So the take home points are, um, you don't need to suffer. Your child doesn't need to suffer. Abdominal pain is very common, um, but it is also very treatable.
okay. So no need to suffer. Um, your child can achieve a healthy gut and poor poops do not have to scare you. Um, there's a lot going on in your little kid, develop, developing, growing, learning um, new things all the time. Okay, and so just remember that the second nervous system is in the gut, so it needs a lot of love and support there. Um, so I would love to answer any questions, support you, your family, um, your your kids, in any anything that comes up. Um, I love treating the whole family. I love treating kids. So I want to be able to be a good resource for you and the families that, um, that you know. So um, the best thing to do would be to like and comment on this, of course, but more importantly, um, call the office, set up a discovery call um, for either you or your child. Um, it's free, 15 minutes. You can ask any questions that you may have um, to assess to see if I would be a good fit to help you. Um, but I, I just want to be of support. I want to be a resource. So anything that I can do to help you guys, let me know. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this webinar series. It was fun for me. I've realized I really like doing webinars, so there will definitely be more to come. Um, but yeah, again, just I'm here for you guys. So let me know how I can help. Okay. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday and I hope to see you soon.